Hi everyone, we're back for our second speaker Q&A this morning, um, Professor Emma Brunskill from Stanford, um, who's done uh, a lot of amazing work across RL and especially in off policy and batch RL. Um, Emma, it's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, so uh, uh, you know, I, I listened to your talk and I, I'm going to start out with just a, a very general question, um, just as a reminder for folks in the audience, if you have questions at any time, please post them in the channel um, and we'll, we'll ask them to Emma. Um, you know, what do you see as the role of looking at already collected data in the process of you know, creating better policies, whether it's for health, but you've also done a lot of work in education. Um, where, where do you see the, what, what do you see all of this already collected data doing for us? I think um, to me, and so I come at just, um, I know this is a very broad audience, and so I come in it as sort of a machine learning and artificial intelligence researcher. That's my background. Um, but one of the things that I got really excited about is during grad school, I was really interested in sort of decision making under uncertainty, um, but most of the ways people were using that and applying it, most of the research was in robotics, and that continues to be a really big area. But um, as we've moved to having enormous amounts of data about uh, sort of static things like um, images and um, and we've been moving to the potential of these enormous electronic medical record systems and also a lot of online educational systems, of course, particularly now, um, we're starting to have these streams of data about decisions made in their outcomes over time. And that's exactly the type of thing we think about in reinforcement learning and decision making under uncertainty is how to use that sort of data to try to make better decisions in the future. And so I think the fact that um, you know, with previous legislation that was passed for that sort of gives a mandate for hospitals to collect this data and also to use it in a way that benefits patient health. Um, I think that these types of tools can be really effective, at essentially trying to mine through those previous sequences um, in order to try to figure out are there sort of additional space to do even better for our, um, for patients than um, than we can do right now by sort of mining for individual variability, like mining for variability in those data sets and leveraging that sort of natural variation to figure out what works better. Yeah, and can you say a little more about that, um, both, um, you know, generally and technically, um, you know, this question of, like, if we look at old data, you know, are we just going to end up copying? Do we just end up imitating what people have done in the past? Um, you know, what's the process by which we could improve? I think that's a really great question. I think, um, and again, sort of the general field of artificial intelligence reinforcement learning and for things like robotics, there's been a huge amount of emphasis of can we even imitate or replicate what humans do? You know, can we do robotic manipulation as uh, as well as humans can manipulate things? Um, uh, and but I think in these cases, I'm pretty optimistic that we can go beyond what is currently state of the art. Um, part of my optimism for that comes from my experience in education and educational games, um, where we found early on that uh, by looking at, we, it was an educational game for sort of, and we had to figure out what activity to give to the child when to sort of maximize persistence. And we had human experts sort of write down what they thought this, like a, a really good sort of engaging decision policy would be. But it was a pretty complicated game. There were a lot of visual elements. It was you know, sp uh, using fractions to feed spaceships energy. Um, and so there's lots of sort of spatial aspects to this. And we found that by using reinforcement learning, we could increase persistence by about 30%. And so that was really sort of the first time for me that I thought, oh, wait, we could do a lot better sometimes than people. Not always, but sometimes, particularly in these cases where we might have general principles. Um, about you know ordering or sequencing, but when we actually look at doing those in a particular context for particular individuals, um, we won't have a lot of data about that one person, um, but we can hopefully extrapolate from the prior data and often find out significant places to make value. Um, and I know in your work too, that you found cases where it looks like there really is a lot of promise to, to going beyond the data and being able to get further improvements. For sure. So a uh, first question has just come in and, and relates to a question I have as well. So I mean, you're you're responsible for creating one of the, the, the weighted, part, at least in a team, the weighted doubly robust estimator, which is pretty commonly used um, in a lot of papers these days, um, as well as other estimators. Um, you know, how do you feel about how these estimators, as for someone who creates them, should be used in practice, especially in the RL for healthcare setting? Um, 
Yeah. So, and so, and just a little bit of background in case people aren't familiar with these, these are estimators that are being used to say if you have a particular new decision policy you want to say, so like a particular new way of treating sepsis, um, and you want to figure out from historical data how good is it like, um, in terms of, say, mortality rates or cost or different objectives you might care about, how do we use this data in a way that um, is hopefully going to be um, have a good mean squared error, you know, have pretty low bias, pretty low variance. Um, I, I think for these type of techniques, one of the things that I've been more and more interested and aware of over time is they often rely on a, a couple common assumptions. Um, and one of the common assumptions is that you have enough support in your data of the new type of policy you want to try out. So, for example, if you never gave vasopressors, um, you're not going to be able to, to um, estimate how good vasopressors will be in the future. That sounds sort of trivial, um, but often when we start to get into these sequences, it's really hard to estimate what sort of overlap we have in coverage. And I think that there's a lot of really exciting work um, going on right now to try to figure that out, including by um, David Sontag's group, who's going to be another speaker I know. But I guess another thing that I think is really interesting and important here is that um, in a lot of these cases, we're hoping to make use of observational data where we, um, it's not a randomized control trial, it's standard healthcare practice or, or from wearables, et cetera. And there could be so many factors that are influencing the decisions that are being made by physicians with individuals. And in particular, they can be confounding variables. Like um, maybe I, I only exercise if I've already eaten breakfast and I'm already in a good mood. And so then, you know, if you, if you nudge or remind me, then maybe there's all these other factors. And if we're not recording some of those, we could make uh, incorrect inferences about what's effective. And so I'm also going to go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, I definitely want to come back to this question of like, you know, unmeasured factors. Um, so this question is also asking, like, you know, but maybe before we get to that, there's so many OPE estimators out there. Um, you know, should we just be like implementing all of them, or do you feel like they're quite similar because they all rely on similar assumptions? Um, are there some that you think are are better to choose in certain circumstances? I think that's a great question. I don't think we know yet. It's something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I think we have some answers. Um, kind of on the asymptotics, like if you have really an enormous amount of data, we have, there's some efficiency, guarantee, efficiency guarantees about whether these are sort of provably best estimators, but I think in reality, we almost always have finite amounts of data, and in those cases, I don't think there's been good face-offs. Most of the cases that are face-offs are inspired by the robotics or kind of other simulated domains, and I'm not sure that there's a few cases we care about yet. So I think it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, great question for people to think about then in this audience. Um, so I want to, yeah, I wanted to come back to this question of, uh, you know, unmeasured confounders, and you, you talk about that a little bit, and you talk about bounding the effects of unmeasured confounders. How do you envision this happening in practice? Like, do you see, like, a, there's some sort of elicitation process that goes through with uh, experts or clinicians to try to figure out, like, how much e extra stuff is going on that's not being modeled? I think if one has access to that, that would be great. Um, I think the more one could get of sort of like a causal graph or causal structure, the better. Um, I think one of the things I found interesting as I went into this is it seems like there's different levels of modeling. There's some ones which sort of make, say, you know, how much using sort of basic facts of probability that they're bounded between zero and one, we already might be able to get some leverage of how much confounding might change things. Um, in the paper error that I mentioned there, we're using a slightly stronger assumption of saying it can't be kind of infinite amounts of confounding. Um, but I think also some recent work by like Elias Kuhnbaum's group says, well, maybe we use sort of a less restrictive assumption, but if you can gather additional data, which you might be able to do things like wearables, or, um, then you could combine between kind of the offline case and online. I, I think it's really tricky in practice the more we get some existing knowledge or some existing expertise i think the better but i think inherently we know this is a very hard problem um and i think places where i feel like we're likely to be able to do better is in cases where if we can talk to an expert who knows some of these additional things or honestly as i think also some of this confounding is probably captured in data like in notes because for legal reasons, often people have to be able to justify decisions. And so as we get better ways to extract information from notes, I think that some things will go away in terms of potential commanders. Cool. Um, so moving on to a, a different topic. So, uh, you know, when we're, RL is typically focused around 
you know, a reward signal that we're trying to optimize. And in practice, there might be multiple objectives and in your talk, you talk about having certain constraints. So you, know, you want to optimize something, we want to make sure certain other bad things don't happen. Um, can you share a little bit about your thoughts on like how to think about RL problems in the context of where there's multiple objectives um, and how do you even extract them from uh, patients, clinicians, there's such a, there's a team of decision makers involved here. Yeah, it's an area I think is really important and really interesting. So we've thought some about um, if you have existing constraints you know about, which could be safety constraints, or it could be um, things like making sure things are equitable between different racial subgroups or different you know, gender subgroups. Um, and I think all of those things are really important because we know that using like deep neural network approximators, um, they're really powerful, but they don't necessarily ensure that this sort of fairness is um, constrained. But I think the issue of like, how do you elicit the, like in general, there'll be many constraints, there might even be cost constraints, how do you elicit those um, and then incorporate that is a really interesting question. Um, and particularly, I think a lot of the work that's happened so far often tries to only get a solution at the end that is fair or satisfies the constraints. Like you'll gather data and then at the end, let's do something. But in cases where we can sort of actively try things out a little bit over time, maybe for mobile health, how do you ensure the sort of the process of exploration is also fair? Um, I think it's a really good question. Yeah. Um, so there's a bunch of questions coming in. So, so two questions both relate to confounding um, in various ways. So one says um, is asking what's the best way to adjust for all the possible variables there could be? Should we remove them after mitigation, do some sort of feature selection in the case where you have maybe access to notes and other pieces, I'm assuming for that question. Um, and kind of a related question is that, uh, you know, many times the healthcare state space doesn't really seem Markovian, or rather you know, we call something a state space and it's not really a state space. And how, how does it affect your op policy evaluation and, and optimization? So I'm putting those together because I think they're both related to questions of confounding. Yeah, I think of those as both being really interesting questions and both related to confounding or what I might call like model specification or misspecification mm -hmm. sure. and what we do with this. Um, I think that the question of model selection um, is a really interesting and important one. And the assumption is that there's some representation that makes things Markovian, um, meaning for anybody in the audience that's less familiar with that, that um, the state representation, the features you're using to make decisions are sufficient um, to capture the dynamics of the system. Uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting, and there's been several papers just at the International Conference of Machine Learning about this and, and ones coming out, um, is that one approach to this is to try to test for that structure. That's the right model. Um, and that's one thing to do, uh, and that can be sufficient. But, but I think one thing that might, to me, is even more exciting is that um, in many cases we don't. Well, in some cases we really want a really good model, and in other cases <laughs> it's sufficient to end up with really good decisions. And so there's been a different sort of line of work over the last year that's thinking about um, maybe you have imagine just you have sort of two different types of models, maybe like a Markovian model and a non. Um, it might be that the Markovian model is uh, in, imperfect, it's not perfect to model the dynamics, but it's a, but the optimal policy can be represented within it, or like a really good one. And so there's been some really cool work recently that says um, you kind of test between different models and um, you look at what is the probability that if you sort of fail that test, you pick the simpler model when the complicated one is better, how much regret or utility do you lose? And to me that's super exciting because if that's our ultimate objective, like optimizing for outcomes for patients, um, Maybe that's the final thing we should focus on when we're trying to optimize, and then the, the model selection part is only kind of a sub part of that process. And, and a related question that was was posted is just how how do you do your like at the end of the day how do you do your validation because there's not really a test set or I mean you can hold out some of your data. Yes. <laughs> Really, really interesting question. And if I, I was just um, uh, emailing with one of Finale's former postdocs, um, Joe Fatuma, about this, um, I think this is a really interesting question. To me, I feel like um, I think it's fine to put all sort of parametric or other domain assumptions into um, sort of the set of policies one's considering. But I think at the end of the day, you want your evaluation to make 
as little assumptions as possible. So that's one of the reasons why I like things like important sampling estimators or weighted doubly robust or other estimators that don't make a Markovian assumption um, and don't make other structural assumptions about the problem because I think we can put that into the class of policies we consider, but then at the end, it, the minimizing the number of assumptions we make in terms of the estimators we're using to finally decide what is good. I think that's really powerful. And I think that that's a really big departure compared to most of AI and reinforcement learning where we're sort of, we can run it in a simulator. We can run it in Mujoko, which is a robotic simulator. Or we can run it on Atari, which is a video game, um, you know, in healthcare and in education, we can't just run it on, you know, 100,000 students who are doing fractions or a lot of patients. So I think the more we can make those final evaluators trustworthy and with minimal assumptions, the better. And I assume at some point we're going to have to actually run some trials. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and because we'll always have some assumptions, you know, we talked about the, the confounding. So um, there will always be some assumptions that are hard to tell. It, you know, it depends on where your data is from. If your data is an RCT, that's different. But if it's observational data, at the end of the day, if you can actually try things out, I think that's um, always the gold standard. For sure. So there's uh, one more question that's asking about, and like during your talk, you talk about you know avoiding entering like high risk regions or states. Um, and so how how do we think about like situations where I'm going to extrapolate a little bit from this question, um, where maybe we're in a low risk setting and the actions don't really matter because it's low risk, or maybe there is something to do, um, but don't we really care about you know? Let's suppose we really care about improving things. And, High risk areas or things that are where, where, where the situation is particularly tense. Um, kind of how, how do we think about that and, and does it relate to the amount of data that's available in various situations? I think that's a really interesting question and in some ways it ties like the whole thread of our conversation because I think that also relates to preference solicitation for individuals. I think a lot of the times when I and some other um, RL researchers come at this, we think, oh, it's a really high stakes scenario. Like, of course, you want to be conservative. Um, but we know, on the other hand, that sometimes people are in scenarios where, unfortunately, they are quite high risk because um, they don't have a lot of options. And so I think being able to take in um, and understand the preferences and elicitation from the individuals could help us understand whether we should be sort of in an optimistic case, like thinking about what's the best, you know, what's under the best case scenario, what might happen for an individual's treatment or sort of Kate estimate versus um, the conservative case. We assume like we kind of want to give people worst case outcomes and maybe really we should be revealing both of those and, and letting people sort of say, you know, under, under the worst case, this is what might happen and the side effects and under the, under the best case, this is also what might happen um, and do so in a way that hopefully I think also thinking about human decision making and how well we can process these sort of alternatives and figuring out which ways to provide information in a way that um, best supports people to, to make good decisions is also like a really interesting HCI question that needs to be addressed. Yeah, and that relates to another question that was just posted is like, you know, what's the process or that you feel should be around requesting users or patients um, to try alternate actions, um, you know, that uh, are there, should there be certain criteria of safety around those or, or transparency? I think that relates a lot to what you were just saying. Yeah, I think I think both ideally. Um, I think we want to and generally be, be as transparent as we can about the potential benefits and the potential limitations. I think I expect that there will always be some safety regulations. Like we, um, even if you might be willing to, we don't necessarily what it's just not ethical in some cases um, uh, to provide some things that are incredibly. Um, uh, th that we just don't think that there's any basis for evidence. Um, and of course, we're seeing nationally right now that there's um, a lot of controversy yeah. around this. So I think, you know, I think we think ethically that, you know, for some amounts of so little data or even potential indications of harm, we need to sort of rule out those actions. But then in other cases, if we can provide that information to individuals, I think that's really important. And I think it's also, you know, an important thing about like who can take advantage of these and what sort of action spaces or interventions are feasible for different individuals um, I, is also a really important question. Yeah, and, and that last point that you mentioned, it, it also relates to part of your talk where you mentioned you know, figuring out what are the, the, the viable actions at any particular point in time. Um, so a lot of people who kind of hack this, including us, um, 
have, you know, just said that if an action's rarely taken in a particular context, just don't do it. Um, you know, we just don't have enough data. Um, in your talk, you, you mentioned other approaches where you, you provide penalties for taking actions that are, you know, that provide pessimism basically under uncertainty. Can you share a little bit about kind of uh, what you think, um, you know, both from like a theoretical perspective and also from a practical perspective, how we should be thinking about limiting the scope of potential actions? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. So, um, uh, as you said, I, I mentioned sort of pessimism, and, and there's been several other works recently thinking about pessimism and model-based approaches. The, I think it's an interesting reason why we do that. So for, for the reason we do that is it's really because of um, statistical um, uncertainty. Like we think that these are places where we just don't have enough data to be confident on the outcomes. I think in some cases you might be able to have scenarios where because of domain knowledge or knowledge of physiology, even a very small number of actions actually does give you a lot of evidence about how well things work. And so if there's information about that, um, or additional contextual variables saying like, you know, under this, like it really is near deterministic, like everyone's temperature goes down in response to Tylenol or things like that. You know, that um, I, I, I think in those cases, we might be able to inject domain knowledge about where, where should we think about kind of constraining um, that certainty. Um, and I think then there's, uh, so I guess that, that, that's what I would say there. And I think pessimism is, is one way to, essentially sort of try to get us to only evaluate things that we think have the sufficient overlap um, because we think that otherwise the policies and decision policies we consider, um, we just may not be able to get a reliable, reliable estimate of how well they do in the future. And again, maybe depending on the preferences of the individual up to safety constraints, maybe in some cases that's okay. In some cases we may be able to say, this is not very reliable. Here is sort of um, confidence over these estimates um, and, and we can leverage those to sort of make decisions downstream. And I think it'd also be really interesting to see for, for different drills, what is the burden of proof they would like in order to um, implement things either for personal decisions or for treatment recommendations. For sure. Um, so we're about out of time. I, I just want to end with, um, you know, are there any directions that you're really passionate about uh, that you encourage, want to encourage the community to think about or just take away points in terms of like using all this work properly? Um, anything you'd like to say? Um, I think to me, I guess the thing I would say is that I think this area of kind of there's a lot of words for it, but like counterfactual or batch or offline learning, I just think it's incredibly exciting. I think, feel like it's got an incredibly long history in things like econometrics and biostatistics, but particularly when we're making sequences of decisions, which I think happens all the time, particularly in healthcare, but in others. I think um, many of us are, you know, care about hopefully making a positive impact on society, but also deeply love math. And so I think it, to me, it's one of these really beautiful areas where if you can get better estimators, you can find better policies, like you, it really could make a, a big difference in a lot of these domains. And yet there's a huge amount of really interesting technical challenges. And so I think for many of us, finding those sort of intersections is incredibly exciting. And I think that, you know, there's just, there's so much still to be done to make things, like we were saying earlier, like what should people use in practice and what sorts of assurances um, can we provide on those? Um, I think is really, it's a really exciting area. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you haven't seen Emma's talk, it's posted on our YouTube channel. So please check it out and also check out her work. Thanks again, Thanks. Emma. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to now finish up uh, this morning session with just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, there's our, our YouTube channel has all of the talks out there. Um, and the link has just been posted in the announcement, so you can go there and take a look. Um, also, our agenda is up there, so you can see the schedule for today. Um, the next thing coming up is our breakout sessions and poster session, which is going to be in gather.town. That's the second link that's in the announcement. Um, and so gather.town, it's this experiment. It's going to be this fun avatar-based world where you can go around. Um, from 11.30 to about 11.50 noon, um, we're going to have seven breakout sessions, which are all posted at mlhc.org slash agenda. Uh, take, please take this opportunity to go hang out, meet someone new on a theme, the discussion of your choice. And then until 1.30 um, Eastern time, it's just the poster session where you can wander around and look at posters. And then after that, we'll come back here to go to webinar for our next two speakers.
Um, so again, please do check out those breakout sessions. It's a great opportunity to meet uh, new people. I'm also going to end with saying that you know MLHC. Um, you know we love all of our speakers and our talks. We love all of our um, papers and posters, um, and we also really love all of you, our community. Um, uh, Randall Wetzel, who is the founder of uh, MuckMed prior to MLHC, that mentioned you know our success is really measured by the collaborations that come out of. Uh, us talking together. So when you go into gather.town, yeah, it's going to look kind of 80s, um, but use the opportunity to chat with each other, um, provide each other constructive critique, respect each other's ideas, um, and help each other, you know, on our way to improving machine learning for healthcare. So I'll see you there at gather.town.